brings us to Politics Monday. And with that, here's Stu Rothenberg, Senior Editor of Inside Elections, and Susan Page, USA Today's Washington Bureau Chief. Susan, let me start with you. And let me start with something that Speaker Pelosi uh, told the Washington Post magazine last week, but they posted it today. She was asked whether she supported impeaching President Trump. She said, impeachment is so divisive to the country that unless there's something so compelling and overwhelming, overwhelming and bipartisan, I don't think we should go down that path because it divides the country and he's just not worth it. This is consistent with what she's been saying uh, in the past, although it's a little blunder, it goes a step further. It's consistent with what Adam Schiff and Jerry Nadler, two of the key Democratic committee chairmen, have been saying. But it is going to make a lot of Democrats unhappy who believe that the right thing is to move ahead with impeachment proceedings against the president. Nancy Pelosi, I think, is speaking from the perspective of someone who lived through the Bill Clinton impeachment, where the House was able to convict, the Senate was, the House was able to impeach, the Senate was not able to convict, and the party that bore the burden of a backlash was a party that impeached, tried to impeach the president. So I think that is the perspective. But there's, the, the Democrats are going to be divided on this issue. And right. members of her caucus are going to be right. unhappy. Right, I, I agree, John. I think basically what she's saying is, do Democrats want to feel good or do they want to win? Uh, many of the younger Democrats, uh, insurgents, uh, anti-establishment Democrats, uh, just can't resist themselves. They, re they really want to take on the president immediately, and impeachment is the way, the, the most immediate way. They just don't have any patience. I think uh, the speaker has history on her side, and um, uh, I think she's right. But, you know, it's not, it's not only a matter of being impatient. If you believe the president has done something impeachable, you may feel that even if we're not going to succeed, we have an obligation to impeach him. And you could also make the point that with Richard Nixon's impeachment, you did not start out with a lot of Republicans in favor of that. It was as evidence built over time through the impeachment hearings that there was Republican yeah, but, and bipartisan but Susan, support. you know the Republicans in the Senate are not going to go along with the conviction. So uh, impeach, impeachment would make Democrats uh, feel good. But I don't think it would accomplish anything. Susan, this morning, the Washington Post had a look inside the Trump re-election campaign. And it sounds like a lot of what he was doing in 2016, big rallies, a lot of data mining, uh, and, and demonizing the opposition. We heard in that tape piece of what the Democrats are talking about, uh, Medicare for all, uh, free college tuition. Are they, in a way, helping by talking this debate about, are you a socialist, are you a capitalist? Are they playing into that in any way? You know, the Democrats are going to have to figure out what kind of coalition they think will defeat Donald Trump, and they are not in agreement on that. You know, there are, there are some Democrats like Stacey Abrams who came pretty close to winning a race she wasn't supposed to win for governor of Georgia, who thinks you do that by persuading and energizing your core supporters. You get young people and minorities uh, uh, excited about your candidacy and your bold proposals, and you get them to the polls. But there are other Democrats who say the way we made big inroads in the midterms last November was by swinging districts that are Purple, where you have to appeal to some voters who are independent-minded or even vote Republican sometimes. I think this is one of the things this long primary season is going to sort out. What kind of Democrat can make the best case that they can defeat Donald Trump? Because if you, I'll tell you one thing Democrats are not divided on, and that is their fervent desire to deny Donald Trump a second term. I think that's a choice Democrats don't have to make. I think they need swing voters, and they need to turn out core voters, uh, younger voters, 18 to 29, significant constituency that's entering the electorate now that is really strongly uh, Democratic, um, uh, non-whites. Non they need to get more of those voters, but they still need to hold on to suburban voters, those swing voters, and college, uh, co white women with a college degree. So I, I think they, I don't think they have to choose one path or the other. They need to do both. This is a time when the Democrats, a lot of the Democratic candidates are introducing themselves to the country. One of them, Kirsten Gillibrand, has had a little, or has hit a little bit of a bump. She's, one of her big issues has been dealing with sexual assault and sexual harassment in the military. And now it turns out, as it's been reported by Politico, that a young woman on her staff, unhappy with how her complaints about sexual harassment and intimidation were handled, quit. What, what do you make of this, Susan? You know, we've had other Democratic candidates have problems along these same lines. Bernie Sanders has as well about his handling during his first presidential campaign about complaints of sexual harassment. But I think this hurts Kristen Gillibrand more. And that's because it's been her signature issue. And for her to have responded inadequately to complaints of sexual harassment by a staffer and moving to fire the staffer who was accused 
only when it was about to become public, I think makes her look uh, hypocritical. So I think it's an issue she's going to have to address in a really forthright rate if she's going to get over it. I agree completely, <clears throat> but I'd add this. <laughs> you only have one chance to make a first impression. And we know the senator. You know the senator. But most voters don't know the senator. And uh, this could be a stumble that she could recover from easily. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, I think, has recovered from the, her Native American stumble, at least partially, uh, or else this could sink uh, Joe Brand's campaign. We'll see. We've also seen some new polling out of, uh, out of Iowa. We're talking about the Democrats have to decide what they want. It's interesting that the, that the top two candidates are Joe Biden uh, and Bernie Sanders, who are and they're, they're the second choice for each first choice. You can't think of some two candidates who are more different uh, in a lot of ways on, on policy issues. Yeah, but I would just say we're almost a year away from the Iowa caucuses. And uh, so I don't take the lineup, the horse race questions on the Iowa poll so seriously. What struck me about that was the policy questions and how liberal the, the Democratic uh, coalition is. In Iowa, there was majority support for the Green New Deal, which I bet most people couldn't define, for Medicare for All, which is a really far-reaching health care proposal. Uh, that surprised me, and that indicated that maybe Stacey Abrams' view of things, where you want to take bold positions, that's certainly what looks like it's going to resonate in Iowa. Yeah, I, I would say Democrats know two candidates, Sanders and Biden. If you pick Sanders, then Biden's your <laughs> backup choice. If you pick Biden, that's Sanders. Stu Rothenberg, Susan Page, thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, John.